Well, as you know, in 12 days, I will be leaving for Tanzania, where I'll be teaching local pastors and church leaders for a couple of weeks. And, and I think I've shared with you, but the topics I've been given to teach on are the doctrines of Scripture, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Jesus, and the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And I've taught the doctrine of God and, and scriptures at other times and shared what I've taught with you on those things. But this year, in preparation for that, we've looked at Jesus Christ throughout all of Advent, how he is fully God, fully man. It was accomplished through the virgin birth and how he fulfills the three anointed offices of prophet, priest, and king as the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. Today and next Sunday, we'll be taking a look and overview at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And I thought about just uh, closing in prayer, because if you were in Sunday school, you got a great uh, 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 lesson on the Holy Spirit, and uh, I, I thank Richard for that. So if you have any questions about the Holy Spirit, don't ask me, ask Richard, okay? But uh, it, it's neat the way that the Holy Spirit works these things, and, and so you're getting a double dose of that uh, today. But as with the other two members of the Godhead, we're just going to be scratching the surface on the Holy Spirit because our triune God is infinite. We're going to spend all of eternity getting to know him better. And like with all these important truths, it's a struggle to get it down to a manageable size to, to fit into our time together this morning. When you look at the Holy Spirit, where do you begin? Well, I thought, you know, the New Testament gives four commands to Christians relating to the Holy Spirit, uh, to the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit, live by the Spirit, do not grieve the Spirit, do not quench the Spirit. I thought about using that as an outline, but there's so much more about the Holy Spirit than just those four commands I decided not to, so study those on your own. What I want to do is start with a summary based on scripture that's found in our church's doctrinal statement about the Holy Spirit. And here's what it says. We believe in one triune God eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Co-eternal in being, co-identical in nature, co-equal in power and glory, and having the same attributes and perfections. We believe that the Holy Spirit is a person who convicts the world of sin of righteousness, and of judgment, and that he is the supernatural agent in regeneration, baptizing all believers into the body of Christ, indwelling and sealing them unto the day of redemption. We believe that he is the divine teacher who guides believers into all truth, and that is the privilege and duty of all the saved to be filled with the Spirit. And the doctrinal statement gives scripture for that, and there's a copy, uh, copies of that in the foyer, or you can find them on the website. But I believe that's what the Bible teaches. The Holy Spirit is God. He is co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal with both the Father and the Son. He possesses all the attributes of deity. He, he regenerates the believing sinner, indwells all who've been converted, and he seals us, uh, keeping us securely in the family of God. Hopefully, we all know that. We all agree with that. But what does that mean to us personally? Let me ask it this way. Which person of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, do you feel closest to? Which one do you know the most about? It's probably not the Holy Spirit. You know, we've all had earthly fathers, so trying to understand the concept of a heavenly father isn't too difficult. The Son of God, I, I mean, he's easier to relate to because he was born as a human. He, he grew up as we did, experiencing the same things, same temptations we face, and yet without sin. And, and our familiarity with his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection causes us to, to feel close to and very grateful for him and for what he's done for each one of us. What about the Holy Spirit? Those of us that grew up with the King James version, the, the Holy Ghost, right? <laughs> I like what Swindoll said about that. He said, to the uninitiated, that name still sounds borderline weird. I mean, a Holy Ghost? What? The, the spooky member of the Trinity? What's that all about? But admit it. Most of the Holy Spirit's work and ministry seems a little vague to us. He's the easiest member of the Godhead to depersonalize. And so it's my prayer that 
we get to know the one who longs to fill us, who longs to empower us. And he's not as mysterious and elusive as we might think. He is to be a vital part of our Christian life. But, but because his, his ways are unfamiliar to us at times, we often miss out. But believe it or not, the Bible has a lot to say about the Holy Spirit. Some of it very familiar. I mean, he convicts of sin. He teaches us. He guides us. He assures us. He intercedes for us. He directs us. He warns us. But then there are also many verses about him that are a little more obscure. For example, Paul writes in Acts chapter 20, or Paul says, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. Well, what in the world does he mean by that? And what are the Spirit's groanings and intercedings on our behalf in, in Romans chapter 8? What does 1 Corinthians 2 mean when it talks about the Holy Spirit's searching all things, including even the depths of God? I thought the Holy Spirit was God. What does that mean? What about his revealing those things to us? What is the anointing of the Spirit? How do we know the Spirit of God? What is the witness of the Spirit? How is the fruit of the Spirit produced? What are the gifts of the Spirit? And we could go on and on, and let alone, what about all the things you see on YouTube or late night TV that are claimed to be done in the name of the Spirit, but are rather strange in light of what Scripture says? I, barking in the Spirit? What's that all about? You know, I'm not going to answer all those questions. I'm not going to answer all the questions you might have, but hopefully we'll be reminded once again of who the Holy Spirit is and what he does for each one of us. But before we get to that, some of our confusion about the Holy Spirit comes from a distortion of biblical truths. And here are just four ways in which we can go wrong in thinking about the Holy Spirit. First of all, we have to know, we have to remember that God is an incomprehensible mystery. We are not going to fully understand God. He's revealed enough about himself for us to come to him in faith, but we don't know everything and we can't know everything. He is above us. He is unequaled. He is transcendent. Even the term person in reference to God is hard for us to understand. And we'll never fully comprehend all there is to know about God. But even when we acknowledge that we don't understand everything about God, we don't understand everything about the Godhead and the Trinity, it's still isn't easy to connect the Holy Spirit to our experience at times. As I said, we know what a father-son relationship is in human terms, but, but where does the Spirit fit into this? Well, sadly, some, even in evangelical circles, have begun referring to the Spirit as mother to make the three persons of the Trinity more understandable to us in our experience. Uh, there's no biblical foundation for that, okay? Even if the Spirit is likened to a mother or a hen in a few verses in Scripture, it's in the Spirit's relation to creation, not within the Godhead itself. And you know, as you read through Scripture, we simply don't have a whole lot of text about the Spirit's role in the Trinity. Even in John's Gospel, where we find most of Jesus' teaching about the Spirit that, that Richard began this morning, the emphasis falls on the relation of Jesus as the eternal Son to his eternal Father. But with that being said, we have a great deal of revelation concerning the Spirit's work in creation, in redemption, in sanctification. Uh, a third danger, you know, the Holy Spirit is so actively involved in the Christian's life that sometimes we can take his presence for granted. You ever done that? Or sometimes we identify the Spirit with our own inner self in some way. And when you try to domesticate the Holy Spirit like this, it, it leads to an almost inner mysticism where we confuse him with our own thoughts. And that's not who he is. The Holy Spirit is the person who works within us, even to the point of indwelling us and interceding. But the Holy Spirit is not our spirit. His voice is not to be confused with our voice. He is a divine person within us, not a divine part of us. And then fourth, when we have a pro proper focus on Jesus, we can wrongly think that the Spirit has a minor role throughout the biblical 
And, and as with the other dangers, it's a distortion of the truth. It's not a contradiction. It distorts the truth. After all, Jesus taught us to read Scripture with himself at the center. Remember, road to Emmaus? He taught the disciples from the Old Testament Scripture about himself. He teaches us in John 14, 15, 16, that the Spirit will testify about and glorify him. And it's unfortunately, unfortunate that the Holy Spirit's ministry today for many people has been distorted into a Christian-centered rather than a Christ-centered thing. I, I like the way that J.I. Packer compares the Holy Spirit to a spotlight that illumines a, a glorious cathedral at night. You know, you, when you go to see the cathedral, you don't stare into that light, do you? No. He writes this. He, the Holy Spirit, is, so to speak, the hidden floodlight shining on the Savior. Or think of it this way. It is as if the Spirit stands behind us, throwing light over our shoulder onto Jesus who stands facing us. The Spirit's message to us is never, look at me, listen to me, come to me, get to know me. But always, look at him, see his glory, listen to him, hear his word, go to him, have his life, get to know him and taste his gift of joy and peace. And so we can be sure that the Spirit is active wherever Jesus is held up as the Savior of sinners as presented in Scripture. And even when we turn our sight to the Spirit to look at him, we always find him engaging, engaged in something related to Jesus. And, and so there's a question we can ask of anything that claims to be a work of the Spirit, and it is this. Does it reveal and glorify Jesus? If it doesn't, it's not a work of the Spirit, because that's what the Spirit of God desires, to glorify and reveal Jesus Christ. And so if it doesn't exalt Christ, it's not a work of the Spirit. For all of this and more, we need to take a step back and get a clearer picture of the Spirit himself, his person, his work, in order to recognize him as someone other than Jesus or someone other as ourselves much less as something. He's not a divine power or resource, no. We need to know who he is as revealed in Scripture. We need to know what he does as revealed in Scripture. And then hopefully we'll gain a fresh dependence on him in every area of our lives. So, so going back to basics, is the Holy Spirit a person or a power? A person, obviously. The, the, the place to begin was the, the nature of the Holy Spirit. Should we even use the pronoun himself? Yes, we should. Is the Holy Spirit a real person whose work is to save and sanctify? Yes, it is. He's not a power that we're to use for our own benefit, no. If we think of the Holy Spirit as a power or energy force, our thoughts will be, how can I get more of the Holy Spirit? If we think of the Holy Spirit as a person, we'll ask, how can the Holy Spirit get more of me? Reuben Torrey states it clearly this way, quote, the conception of the Holy Spirit as a divine influence or power that we are somehow to get hold of and use leads to self-exaltation and self-sufficiency. One who so thinks of the Holy Spirit and who at the same time imagines that he has received the Holy Spirit will almost inevitably be full of spiritual pride and strut about as if he belongs to some superior order of Christians. But if we once grasp the thought that the Holy Spirit is a divine person of infinite majesty and glory and holiness and power, who in marvelous condescension has, has come into our hearts to make his abode there and take possession of our lives and make use of them, it will put us in the dust and keep us in the dust. I can think of no thought more humbling or more overwhelming than the thought that a person of divine majesty and glory dwells in my heart and is ready to use even me, end quote. And this distinction between a person or a power is seen in the pages of Scripture. I mean, think back to the, the, the story of Simon the magician, whose, whose story is told in Acts 8 there. Simon was a citizen of Samaria. Philip 
came to Samaria preaching the gospel, and apparently Simon believed and Jesus was saved because we read these words in, in Acts chapter 8. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed, as he should have been. I, I mean, Simon, at this point, knew very little about Christianity. So when he saw the, the miracles that were performed, when he was amazed by them, he fell into the air of thinking of the Holy Spirit as a power that could be purchased. And so later when Peter and John came to see what was going on in Samaria and were used of God to impart the Spirit to others, Simon offers to give the disciples money so that they would give him this power. Remember how Peter replies? May your silver perish with you. Because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. Okay? Thinking of the Holy Spirit as a power, energy force. Certainly not biblical. And a contrasting example comes at the beginning of the missionary work of Paul and Barnabas. In Acts chapter 13... It says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So in that first example, Simon the Magician, he wanted to get and use God. Here with Paul and Barnabas, God got and used two people. And yet as you study scripture, some sections of the bible in many passages it seems the distinct personality of the holy spirit isn't present especially as you go through the old testament i mean the old testament often speaks of the spirit of god somewhat vaguely there are references to uh, genesis 1 2 the spirit of god was moving over the surface of the waters sometimes it refers to individuals whom it said the spirit of the lord clothed them and, and these verses may give hints of the personality of the Spirit. But in the Old Testament, there's very little in the way of a clear presentation of the personal distinctness of the Holy Spirit. But it's entirely different when we come to the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is shown to be a member of the Trinity, equal in all ways to both the Father and the Son, and yet distinct from them. Okay, doctrine of the Trinity. You understand it? Hope? My, no, you don't. Even if you think you do, you don't. Do you believe it? Yes. Scripture teaches it. As has been succinctly stated, God is three persons. Notice, person, Father, person, Son, person, Holy Spirit. Each person is fully God. God is one. Okay? In our minds that we try to think logically, that doesn't make sense. God is above us. There aren't three gods. There's one God in three persons. There are three persons, but in a way that's beyond our understanding, these three are one. We should never refer to the Holy Spirit as it, right? He's as much a person as the Father is, as the Son is. And yet when we use the word person, we think of humans, right? We expect a person to be like us with a body and a soul. And yet we speak of a person dying when we should say their body died, right? We know that when a person dies, they haven't ceased to exist. Their soul is either in heaven or in hell. A person then does not have to have a body, right? Likewise, we, we know angels exist as real beings, yet they don't have human bodies. God himself is spirit, it says, and yet he's a person. And so because of this, if the Holy Spirit has similar characteristics as persons do, we can conclude that he too is a person. So what is a person? Well, it can be defined as one who has knowledge, feelings, and a will. A simple definition. That's exactly what scripture teaches about the Spirit. He has knowledge, he has feelings, he has a will. And without going into great detail... A person has these things, a thing lacks them, right? The chair you're sitting on is not a person. It has no intelligence, it has no feelings, it has no will. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. 
He has intelligence, emotions, a will. John 14, 16 and 17. Jesus says regarding the Holy Spirit, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. If the Holy Spirit were not a person and just a power, this promise would be more like compensation. It would be something like, I'm going to be going away from you. I'm going to be taken away from you, but I'll give you something to make up for my departure. But that's not what it says. The Holy Spirit is not just a something, not just a power. He is a divine person, a personality, a person who has knowledge. How do we know the Holy Spirit has knowledge? Well, because he know, he'll know the disciples' needs. He, he identifies with them in their distress. He comforts them, right? He's the comforter. He will help them in fulfillment of the Lord's commission. And, and the New Testament evidence for the distinct personality, the personhood of the Holy Spirit, can be roughly grouped in, into these categories. The personal actions of the Holy Spirit, first of all. John 16 speaks of the Spirit's work of convicting unbelievers. Jesus says, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. If he's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and he must have intelligence, right? He has knowledge of these things. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Okay, so Jesus tells his disciples there, the Holy Spirit convicts the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And I believe sin there refers not to sin in general, but specifically to the ultimate sin of refusing to believe in Jesus Christ, who he is. The issue that determines people's eternal destiny then and now is how they react to the Spirit's convicting ministry concerning their own sin and the provision of forgiveness by grace through Jesus Christ. And so not only does the Spirit convict unbelievers of their sin, but also of the necessity of having the perfect righteousness of Christ credited to their account. Because when we compare our wickedness to his sinless holiness, we get a glimpse of how detestable, how, how wicked we are. And we're faced with the utter impossibility of salvation by any effort, work, or achievement on our part. No one is good enough, right? Right? You can't be good enough. And so those who listen to the Spirit's testimony about their sinfulness and about Jesus' righteousness and respond to the gospel in faith are instantly clothed with Christ's righteousness. Aren't you glad for that? Our sins are placed fully on him. And in his death, at the hands of God's holy justice, he paid the penalty in full. The Holy Spirit also convicts the world concerning judgment, it says, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Have you ever noticed... The world's judgments are often wrong, even sometimes evil. We clearly see this in their rejection of the Son of God in Scripture, right? Uh, while the world is incapable of always judging righteously, the Spirit always does so. And, and obviously the ruler of this world is Satan himself. He's already been judged, it says. He was totally defeated at the cross, as we know. But even though he's been defeated and judged, the final sentence against him is not going to be carried out until the end of the millennium, right? In the meantime, he goes about still today as the God of this age, seeking to capture and devour souls. And so the sober, sobering warning to those who embrace this world and its system is that since its ruler will not escape judgment, neither will they unless they repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ. The devil's fate guarantees the judgment of every unrepentant sinner. And, and so when the Spirit of God does that convicting work in a person, there are only two possible responses, repentance or rejection. We also see in Scripture that the Holy Spirit's mission is distinct from the Father's mission and from the Son's mission. I mean, Jesus clearly says this in John 15, 26. He says, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. Now, we're going to talk more about that probably next week. But, but the spirit's work 
is clearly different from the father's work and the son's work. Just as the son's work is different from the father's work and from the spirit's work. They have different roles within the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, the Holy Spirit's rank and power are equal to those of the father and the son, right? We see this even in the various uh, references that, that refer to the Trinity in Scripture. Matthew 28, 19, the disciples are told to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, Paul prays that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Peter speaks of those who are Christians according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ, right? Jude speaks of our being built up in the Christian faith as we're praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping ourselves in the love of God, and waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Clearly, the Holy Spirit is equal to the Father and the Son. We see the Holy Spirit as a person in his appearances, in scripture, in visible form. At the baptism of Jesus, you remember it, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out from heaven, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. And on the day of Pentecost, there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, the Holy Spirit descending. And these visible appearances show he's a distinct person from the other members of the Godhead, and yet he's still God. Can we sin against the Holy Spirit? Yeah, clearly. We talked about the uh, unforgivable sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in, in Mark chapter 3 a, a month or two ago, but that implies a sin against a person. It's possible to grieve the Spirit, according to Ephesians 4. You know, it's hard to grieve somebody if they have no emotions. I mean, even if you weigh more than the chair bears, it's not grieving, right? But as a person, the Holy Spirit has emotions, has feelings. The Holy Spirit also gives gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, after having itemized the, the gifts, Paul says what? One and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. And these gifts of the Holy Spirit are distinguished from the Holy Spirit himself, indicating he, he's not just a force behind them, but that he gives them as he wills, or it could be translated as he purposes, showing a definite act of his will. And so all these show that the Holy Spirit is a person. And yet the problem for many of us may not be so much with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit as with our attitude toward him. I mean, theoretically, we believe the Holy Spirit is a person, the third person of the Trinity. But do we actually think of him in that way? Do we think of him at all? You know, maybe we're like the, the lady who attended a series of messages on the Holy Spirit at a Bible conference years ago. She listened carefully. She learned a lot. She came up to the speaker afterward to thank him for his teaching. And she said, before your messages, I never thought of it as a person, referring to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, obviously, she still wasn't thinking of the Holy Spirit as a person. She was on her way. But and I mean, once again, how can you understand scripture like Matthew 28, 9, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? How can you think of that as referring to two persons, the Father and the Son, and one thing, the Holy Spirit? You can't. The Holy Spirit is a person just as God the Father is a person, just as God the Son is a person. And so the second question that goes hand in hand with that is the Holy Spirit God. Uh, hopefully we all know the answer to that. But the proof of the Holy Spirit being a person and not a force doesn't necessarily prove that he's God. But if the Holy Spirit is God, he must also be a person because God is a person. Clearly, the Holy Spirit is a distinct person, but is he divine? Is he God? Or is he some lesser being, perhaps an under God or, or an angel of some sort? No. 
Is the Holy Spirit full deity like the Father is and like the Son is? And hopefully you know the answer is yes. One of the clearest indications of the full divinity of the Holy Spirit is found on the lips of Jesus when he promised his disciples to send the Spirit to them. To be, what? Another helper. That word another is important. In Greek, there are two different words for another. One means another that is totally different. One means another just like the first one. Which one do you think is used here? Another one just like the first one. So Jesus says, I'm going to send a person just like myself. Was Jesus fully God? Oh, you, if you don't know the answer to that, I'm going to throw a book at you. If Jesus is fully God and he says, I'm going to send another helper that is just like me, that other helper has to be God as well. So the first helper is Jesus. He's leaving. He's going away. He'd been the disciple's strength and counsel during the years of his ministry among them. Now he's going away, and in his place, he's going to send a second helper, the Holy Spirit, who is just like him, another divine person living with them and in them. We see other evidences for the divinity of the Holy Spirit. I mean, take the phrase, Holy Spirit. Think about it. Holy. That designates the innermost essence of God's nature. He is the Holy Father. He is the thrice holy, 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 holy Father. Jesus is the Holy One of God. The Spirit is holy, just as God is holy, just as Jesus is holy. The Spirit knows the things of God in a way that, that we do not know because he is God. In Scripture, we won't take the time to go there. The Spirit of God is said to be omniscient like God is, all-powerful like God is, omnipresent like God is. I mean, think of it this way. If the Holy Spirit has all the same attributes of God himself, what does that mean? The Holy Spirit is God. He is divine. The Spirit obviously does things that only God can do. Some of the works which only God can do and which the Holy Spirit does and which shows that he must be God. Things like regeneration, you know, causing a person to be born again is a work of the Spirit. It's a work of God, right? Uh, being the means of, of Mary's pregnancy with Jesus, his supernatural virgin birth is something only God can do. The creation of the universe, right? Only God can do that. It's also said the Holy Spirit took part in that. Uh, the Holy Spirit inspired and imparted the scriptures that we have before us today. He's the agent of new birth. He's the agent of salvation, of our sanctification, ultimately of our resurrection. The Holy Spirit does the work of God. Why? Because he is God. And we see throughout scripture the equality of the Holy Spirit with God the Father and God the Son. He's presented as equal. One of the proofs that the Holy Spirit is fully God is his identification with Yahweh. Jehovah, God in the Old Testament. And we see this in passages where Scripture in the Old Testament says Yahweh says something. And then the New Testament quotation of that same passage is attributed to the Holy Spirit as the speaker. So what does that tell us? God and the Holy Spirit, right? One God. Isaiah 6, verse 8 begins. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who was speaking there? The voice of the Lord, right? In Acts 28, that passage is quoted, but it begins like this. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your father, saying, and then gives that quote. What's that telling us? Clearly, it's saying the Spirit, like Yahweh, is fully divine. As a matter of fact, it gets even clearer, and it goes hand in hand. The name of God is used interchangeably with him in one account. In Acts chapter 5, you remember the story, Ananias, Sapphira, that whole debacle there. Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to who? To the Holy Spirit. And to keep back some of the price of the land. You have not lied to men, but to the Holy Spirit. No, God. Clearly, the Holy Spirit is God. The third member of the Trinity. Does it matter that we know the Holy Spirit is God? Yes, it does. If we know 
and recognize his deity. We will recognize and rely on him and his work. Once again, J.I. Packer asked this question, quote, Do we honor the Holy Spirit by recognizing and relying on his work? Or do we slight him by ignoring it and thereby dishonor not merely the Spirit, but the Lord who sent him? In our faith, do we acknowledge the authority of the Bible, the prophetic Old Testament, the apostolic New Testament, which he inspired? Do we read and hear it with the reverence and receptiveness that are due to the word of God? If not, we dishonor the Holy Spirit. In our life, do we apply the authority of the Bible and live by the Bible, whatever men may say against it, recognizing that God's word cannot but be true? If not, we dishonor the Holy Spirit who gave us the Bible. In our witness, he says, do we remember that the Holy Spirit alone and by his witness can authenticate our witness and look to him to do so and trust him to do so and show the reality of our trust as Paul did by eschewing the gimmicks of human cleverness? If not, we dishonor the Holy Spirit. Can we doubt that the present barrenness of the church's life is God's judgment on us for the way in which we have dishonored the Holy Spirit. And in that case, what hope have we of its removal till we learn in our thinking and our praying and our practice to honor the Holy Spirit? End quote. You know, the, the, the personality, the deity of the Holy Spirit are very practical things because it is by his activity that the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ is made clear to us. It changes our life. He and he alone is the key to a vital and thriving Christian life. And, and, and so this morning we looked at who he is. He is a person who is fully God. Next week we'll look at more what he does for each one of us. But we must know him. We must rely upon him moment by moment, day by day. Let's pray together, and then I'll have the men come before communion. Father, we come before you thanking you that in your wisdom that you have sent us the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to convict us, to teach us, to guide us. Father, may we have a better understanding of who he is. Father, may we get to know him through your word, through his work in our lives. May we rely upon him because, Father, we cannot live the life that you want us to live in our own power, but only through the Spirit empowering us. And so, Lord, we look to you, asking you that we would be dependent and yielded to your spirit, Father, that we would want what you want, and Father, that we would show our love for Jesus by our obedience to him in the power of the spirit. And Father, even as we come to the communion table this morning, we ask that we would be reminded of what you have done for each one of us in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, in the sending of your spirit to indwell us, and Father, we look forward to that day when Jesus Christ comes again. And Father, we see him as he is and become like him and spend eternity with you. Teach us these things. Speak to us from the elements of communion, we ask in your name. Amen.